Awesome. Okay, so for our second talk today, we have Sebastian Picard, who will be speaking on geometric flows and heterotic string theory. Great. All right. Well, uh, yeah, thanks a lot for the uh, uh, invitation, right? So, uh, uh, I, I was, um, <clears throat> yeah, I was uh, requested to give a more intro talk to a, a broad, broader audience. So we're going to start with um, more of a historical overview of uh, geometric flows. That will be part one of the talk. Uh, and then part two of the talk, um, uh, we'll give kind of a brief introduction to how equations from complex geometry can come out of uh, equations from string theory. And then part three of the talk, uh, we'll describe uh, a geometric flow, which is in that uh, context of uh, complex geometry uh, <clears throat> coming out of string theory. So let's start by Hamilton, 1982. This is, uh, in my opinion, one of the greatest papers of all time. It is an amazing paper. And here's the main theorem, right? Let x be a compact three manifold, uh, and you have a Riemannian metric on it. It's got positive Ricci. Then actually, that manifold admits a metric of constant curvature. And so since we understand metrics of constant curvature, so in particular, say x is simply connected, manifold of dimension three compact, you've got a metric on there with positive Ricci, uh, boom, then you're a sphere, right? Uh, so this is great theorem. How did he prove it? By introducing the Ricci flow, right? So this is his equation star on the, on the right-hand side. <clears throat> and there it is, right? Uh, first time, right? Uh, Hamilton wrote down the Ricci flow section three evolution equation and there it is uh, dt gij is equal to minus two uh, rij so um yeah i think this is an incredible paper because well for for one thing right it's got this bringing in this novel equation right that you know this is introducing the ricci flow this equation kind of you know came out of nowhere it has these great properties, right? Introduces it, starts studying it, and then right out of the gate, there's this killer application, right? There's this uh, this, this this big theorem about um, three manifolds with with strictly positive curvature. So I think it's it's totally incredible, right? How how how, how this all worked out, and also I love this paper because um, it's so clearly written. It's it's really a pleasure to read. Um, it's it's, uh, it's it's really great exposition. Um, well, except, okay, right, so I should say, right, so if we look at these sections, right, there's section four, five, six, right, notorious section four, five, six, so forget about, forget about section four, five, six, that was, those, that, that's the short time existence part, that's the part, so when this paper came out, right, everyone was excited, everyone checked it, um, you know, people were giving talks and seminars all over the world, and section 4.6, right, that was the one, <laughs> people weren't so convinced of that, but the rest of it is just so, so, so perfectly clearly written, and of course, later on, and the short time existence was was uh, given a new proof using the Turk flow, which is another crystal clear direct um, proof in, in any of the uh, textbooks or references on the Ricci flow that you'll find now. They'll for the short time existence they'll give the uh, the Turk uh, version of the short time existence. But in this original paper, other than that, the rest of the paper I think is you know even better written than any other subsequent references. I think it's just, it's it's a really really nicely crystal clear direct kind of style of math. Um, like here are some of the pages here, selected pages, right? I mean, it's just direct calculation, right? It just goes in there, boom, directs, calculates, estimates. It's really the kind of style of math that, uh, that I really like to read. Um, so high praise for this paper, um, right? So how, so very broadly, right? Starts with a, a arbitrary metric, it's got positive curvature, um, flows it along the Ricci flow, shows that this positivity is preserved and in fact uh, all the <clears throat> curvature components all go to the same thing right this is section 10 pinching the pinching estimates right pinching of the eigenvalues um, that all the uh, eigenvalues uh, in the limit uh, of, the, of the curvature all go to the same thing and then um, if you're simply connected you end up on a sphere so this was kind of one of the great big uh, <clears throat> big foundational papers of geometric flows. And um, kind of at a high level, right, what's, what's the idea? Well, you have a manifold, you have a metric on it, 
and you'd like to write down an analog of the heat equation. You want a version of the heat equation, um, but uh, with respect to this object here. And all you have to work with is a manifold and a metric. So for the heat equation on the right-hand side, you want to put the Laplacian of whatever object you're, you're working with. And so the question becomes, what's the Laplacian of the metric tensor? And so, but before you ask that, you got to figure out what's the second derivative of the metric tensor. So, right, you can't just take coordinate derivatives of the metric tensor because that's not going to give you another tensor. So, um, the only thing you can do is the, the, the Riemann curvature tensor, right? That's the combination of second derivatives uh, of the metric tensor, which gives you another tensor, another object in geometry. So, if you want to take two derivatives of the metric, it's got to be the curvature, but then you can't do dt gij equals rijkl indices don't match. So it's got to be the Ricci, right? You've got two indices on the left, you've got to put two indices on the right. And, uh, and there you go. So that, that's, that's the Ricci flow. And um, in fact, it is, uh, can be interpreted right as sort of a, a heat flow for the metric. Uh, you can see this clearly if you work in special coordinates, right? Because if you look in uh, arbitrary co uh, coordinates, right, the Ricci, it's got a lot of combinations of second derivatives of the metric. But if you do some gauge fixing or fix certain special coordinates, you can see something a little bit more clearly. So one example, one kind of coordinate fixing you can do is choose harmonic coordinates, right? So this is a, <clears throat> um, this sort of technique was 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 done in, in, in general relativity in like the 1950s by uh, Shokeb Huat, uh, looking at the Einstein field equations, did this sort of gauge fixing. And this sort of thing also works uh, here in this Riemannian setting. So look at these special coordinates. And now in these coordinates, you do see the Laplacian. So you see that the Ricci is uh, like a Laplacian of the coordinate of the components of the metric. Uh, but then there's also some nonlinear terms. It's not just the Laplacian. It's got some nonlinear terms of, of, of first order. And so in this way, um, the Ricci flow can be thought of uh, kind of a heat flow for the metric tensor. But of course, it's not strictly not you know just a heat flow. There's also a lot of other. Um, nonlinear terms. Uh, so here's where this, this, this famous minus two, right? So there's a story. So, right, so, so Richard Hamilton teaches the uh, Ritchie flow class at Columbia, right? So when I was a grad student, I took that class. And uh, yeah, he always tells a story about how uh, uh, he was unhappy with this minus two, right? A more elegant equation maybe, you know, would have been uh, derivative of the metric is equal to the Ritchie. The two doesn't matter. You can rescale the two with time, but the minus, right? Um, the minus kind of looked a little bit off, right? And, um, but but it you know it, it just doesn't work the other way, right? You can't you won't get short time existence um, if you don't put the minus sign. Um, but but in any case, apparently Hamilton was trying to come to terms with this, and <laughs> he, he tells a story that the realization came to him when he was in the shower. <laughs> so he was just standing in the shower, right? And he looked, and then he realized, ah, oh, yes, water only flows one way. <laughs> So, so, so there it is. Um, you know, the 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 math, the calculations telling you it's got to be minus Ricci, right? And uh, and and that's there's there's no other way to go the other way. That's that's the way of the flow, right? And and you can't go back the other way. Um, I guess this is one of the differences, right, between ODE and PDE. So in ODE, when you have short time existence, uh, you can flow forward and backwards, right? If you're spinning at time zero, you always have minus epsilon to epsilon ODE. You can go go back and forth. But for PDE, that's there's only one direction you can go right and uh and and and, and for ellipticity in this case it's got to be the minus richie that's the only way that's the only way to go so this is another section of hamilton's paper um right so this is uh in this paragraph here right so this is where he says um this idea of a heat flow so we we start with any metric gij of strictly positive curvature and try to improve it by means of a heat equation so that's the idea of Hamilton that wants an analog of the heat equation for the metric tensor. Um, oh yeah, that's true. Right, right off the bat here, he notices, uh, yeah, it would be natural to try to minimize an energy functional. Unfortunately, we cannot form any geometrically meaningful quadratic expression in the first derivative of GIJ, et cetera, et cetera. And so this points out one of the many difficulties with the Ricci flow is that um, he identified that there's, uh, it, was, it, was, it was difficult to find uh, a monotone quantity or an energy functional. In classic PD techniques, that's the first thing you do. Um, you want to find a functional, an energy, or a quantity that decreases or increases. There's monotone along the flow, and that gives you the starting point of a lot of your estimates. But in this case, in the Ricci flow, 
um, no such thing. And so that was one of the difficulties with um, using the Ritchie flow. Um, and we'll come back to that <coughs> later when we um, uh, come to, to, to Perelman's contribution. And, uh, and so the other thing in this paragraph says, where our method of proof is inspired by the ideas of Els and Samson. So what's this Eels Samson paper? So this is a paper from the 1960s. And I think this is also you know, one of the foundational papers in, uh, in geometric flows. Um, and so what kind of geometric flow was it? So in this context, right, it's flowing different objects. It's not the metric tensor. It's a map between two manifolds. So you have F, which is a map between two different manifolds. And uh, you're looking for special maps that solve kind of a higher dimensional version of the geodesic equation. So you can think of, so this equation at the bottom here, it's a generalization of if, if the domain is just the uh, interval zero to one into M, then this is the equation for geodesics. But now instead of uh, just uh, <clears throat> zero to one as your uh, domain manifold, you take an arbitrary manifold into another one. And then there's a higher dimensional uh, analog of, uh, of the geodesic equation. How do they study it? How do they try to solve it? They use geometric flow, right? So it's this equation two, they flow the map. They start with a map between two manifolds and then start flowing it uh, by a heat equation. And this uh, tau on the right-hand side of equation two, I copy pasted from another part of their paper. It gives um, definition of it. And it's uh, again, a non-linear kind of heat equation. There's a Laplacian, there's some non-linear terms also you're in geometry. So when you take covariant derivatives, you may have curvature coming in. Um, so this was one of the first papers that brought this idea of you have a problem in geometry. In this case, it's a map between two spaces. That, then you want to deform your map to find another map with maybe a better, better properties, more optimal kind of properties. And you deform it via a heat equation using kind of natural quantities in geometry. And, um, and so after these two successes, um, it's kind of inspired a lot of other work in geometric analysis. Um, in this theme of you have an object in geometry and you flow it by a nonlinear heat equation, right? And use that to study your problems. So I'm going to serve you a couple of them just from the 1980s, right? So Ilsen Sampson, this was a map between two spaces, Hamilton, it's the metric tensor. Another great paper, classic example of geometric flows solving big problems. This is Donaldson's paper um, on uh, Yang Mills equation <clears throat> uh, over uh, holomorphic vector bundles. Right, so this was uh, uh, what's now called the Donaldson Yulin Becquiao theorem. So Yulin Becquiao also came up with an independent proof, which actually doesn't use geometric flows, <laughs> but Donaldson's proof did use geometric flows. Um, all right, and this is the theorem that uh, right, you have a, a holomorphic vector bundle uh, over a complex manifold, and the existence of a Yang Mills connection on that bundle is equivalent to the notion of stability. Uh, and this is stability condition for algebraic geometry. So this is kind of a great interplay between on one hand PDs uh, and on the other hand, algebraic geometry. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to right, point out that in the method of proof, right, it's by, it's by flow. So um, it's, a, it's another example where we, this is a, a, another context this time we're flowing the connections. So this time you have a vector bundle, you're looking for an optimal connection on this vector bundle. And so the flow is on the space of connection. So we start the connection, now the connections on the vector bundle start moving. And this here is sometimes called the Donaldson heat flow. And, uh, and by studying the behavior of this flow at infinity, right? This is uh, how Donaldson was able to prove his theorem. And uh, yeah, here again, I just wanted to point out, right? The shout out to uh, Eels and Samson, right? So in Donaldson's paper, you're right, the, uh, pays uh, respects right? following the, the method of Eels and Samson for the analogous problem of harmonic maps. We derive differential inequalities for these functions. So these kind of techniques right, are put into use to solve these big, great, um, I would say, Fields Medal winning problems. right? Um, all right, so another example. right? So this is another one in, uh, in complex geometry. This is the starting point for the kähler ritchie flow. So Hamilton introduced the Ritchie flow. And very soon after, in 1985, uh, Tsao uh, proposed uh, to look at the Ritchie flow in the context of Kähler geometry. And um, in this setup, if your initial metric on a complex manifold then is Kähler, go with the Ritchie flow, uh, and you stay Kähler, and you have a flow which stays in Kähler geometry. And, um, and one of the big advantages of this is uh, that the flow 
in uh, in Kähler geometry becomes one for a single scalar potential. Uh, that's this equation 0 0.9. So the Ricci flow is right a system. You've got the whole metric tensor moving, and in this case, the flow reduces to just a single potential function u, which moves along in this uh, parabolic Mont-Jean-Pierre type equation. And uh, right, this you know, eventually started a whole, a whole field of research, right, on, on, on Kayla Ritchie flow. In Sal's paper, right, it was looking at um, like Calabiao or, 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 or manifolds with negative first turn class. And of course, the Kayla Einstein problem on Fano manifolds then, you know, was 20 years of, or 20 plus, more than 20 years, 20, 30 years of, uh, of active research and the Kayla Ritchie flow was uh, a, part of, a part of that story. Um, the last, so the last flow I uh, want to mention in these kind of examples from the 80s, um, these big great papers from the 80s um, using geometric flows is, is, is Huiskin. Uh, this one's not in, in complex geometry, so we, well, I won't uh, emphasize or return to it, but uh, this is another flow in another context where you're uh, flowing the map. Well, uh, well, yeah, if you view it as an immersion. So this is the um, mean curvature flow. You've got a hypersurface uh, inside of Rn plus one, and then you start evolving the hypersurface by its mean curvature. And uh, and again in equation one, you see that the, this family of map again moves by some sort of um, nonlinear heat equation. And so this is another uh, nonlinear heat equation uh, in uh, in uh, in differential geometry. But so I, but I want to say, other than, other than this, I would say in the 90s, um, it was, you know, re relatively quiet. I would say the, 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 the pure mathematical community maybe didn't fully embrace geometric flows, right? And the 80s had these big successes. And then in the 90s, um, you know, this, of course, oversimplifying, but, you know, you still had Hamilton who was going all in, pushing the Ritchie flow, you had Huiskin developing some great super technical work on mean curvature flow, but maybe more broadly, there wasn't maybe as much recognition um, in the pure math community. There's another great success was this uh, Penrose inequality. Um, and this was proved using inverse mean, cur mean curvature flow. But again, the average pure mathematician, uh, Penrose inequality, you know, it's, it's maybe not something that uh, the average pure mathematician was, um, you know, aware, super excited about. So, uh, you know, in my opinion, I, I would say geometric flows were still kind of a niche research interest um, in pure mathematics in the 90s. But then everything changed when Perelman dropped this on the archive. So yeah, here comes Perelman in uh, November 2002. Post this paper on archive, Perelman right, already recognized you know, one of the, one of the great hardcore uh, Riemannian geometers, right? big theorems in comparison geometry and hardcore Riemannian geometry, and drops this paper on archive. And, uh, and, and after that, you know, ge geometric flows could, could no longer be ignored, right? I mean, um, right away, everyone saw that this was full of, of new uh, and, and deep and novel ideas. And, uh, and, and, and eventually, right, there was a sequence of three papers uh, Posted on archive uh, with uh, with the, the full solution of the uh, of the Poincaré conjecture, and uh, so Poincaré conjecture, of course, that's you know one of the biggest, most famous problems in all math, uh, millennium problem. So this had uh, a huge impact on, on on pure math. All of a sudden, right, everybody and their uncles working on geometric flows, right? You had the topologists who, you know, never computed a curvature tensor in their lives, right? Now they're, you know, they're, they're jumping into, they're jumping into Ricci flow and, and geometric flows, right? This was, um, uh, this paper kind of generated huge amounts of activity and, and, and also, you know, not, not only because of, right, proof of a famous result, but uh, these papers were just so full of novel ideas that, uh, you know, there's so much work uh, that came out afterwards of kind of adapting, extending, bringing these ideas into different contexts and solving different problems it just generated huge, huge amounts of, of, uh, of activity. Um, so just one example, just right out of page five of Perelman, 
um, you know, right away you start reading this and, and, and all of a sudden here comes all these new functionals, right? That, 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 that no one had seen before, right? The problem was the Ricci flow wasn't a gradient flow. There were no monotone quantities, but here's a way to make it a gradient flow by adding this auxiliary function. All of a sudden there are all these monotone quantities and it kind of opened the door to all sorts of stuff. So, um, right, even though <clears throat> it wasn't immediately clear, it's very technical, right? That, that this was a complete proof of the Poincaré inequality. It was immediately clear that this was full of novel and new ideas. I can't believe I put this in the <laughs> okay. Well, um, so <laughs> so yeah, right. So it's it's a big it's a big um famous <laughs> big famous problem. So uh, with that came uh, a lot of controversies and drama, and the media got involved. Right. Um, I mean, it's a great story, right? I mean, it's it's, it's a millennium problem, million dollar problem. So of course, the you know the media is going to be attracted to that, right? Um, and then, you know, there's all the stories, right? So, you know, Perelman did a tour of the US, all the top US schools presented his work, um, tried to communicate, explain what he was doing, but then, um, you know, decided he had it with the mathematical community and then basically left the mathematical community and then rejected the Fields Medal, right? It's a great, it's a great story. Um, so the media got on there. We've got some examples like this <laughs> ridiculous, <laughs> this uh, this hit piece on Yao <laughs> by the by the New Yorker. Uh, this yeah ridiculous defamatory article right um, by the New Yorker is throwing in Yao under the bus. And then there's uh, there's Yao's response right in the uh, in the New York Times right. So you've got these big publications right New Yorker New York Times covering this big problem in math a big controversy you know everyone's everyone's watching it's uh yeah it's <laughs> good stuff um I bet here's here's a excerpt from the New York Times right talking about Poincaré conjecture the conjecture first set forth by Poincaré may be the most famous problem in mathematics in 1982, right, 19, 1982, Hamilton of Columbia devised a method known as the Ricci flow to investigate the shapes of spaces. And Dr. Yao was enthusiastic that this method might finally crack the Poincaré conjecture. Uh, and then in 2003, a Russian mathematician, Gregory Perelman, sketched a way to jump a roadblock that stimmied Dr. Hamilton and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, this is New York Times giving, you know, big press coverage to, to pure mathematics. And of course, with all this excitement, uh, geometric flows uh, skyrocket. <laughs> um, all of a sudden, it's one of the most popular fields uh, in, in differential geometry. So I just went on, on math sign uh, and I just typed in like differential geometry, most cited papers <laughs> of all time. It's a great list, right? So of course, Perelman's archive preprints won't, won't be there. This is only for published stuff. So Perelman is uh, archived, so it won't be on this math sign list. But uh, this is the list of the most cited papers in differential geometry. It's it's not a bad list, right? Well, I guess at the time when I clicked this, <laughs> Hamilton was winning by one, <laughs> by one point, right behind him is Yao's Calabi conjecture. Um, but anyway, so Hamilton Ricci flow number one, right? So that that just shows how um, how popular and how how big this field has become. Um, and you know, yeah, this is this is a, these are all these are all great papers. This is a great list. Yeah, so this is just yeah, math sign at uh, most cited papers in the field of uh, differential geometry. Um, okay, so anyways, so let's, uh, right, focus to complex complex geometry. Um, so there are now, you know, many different flows, uh, specialized to different contexts, right? So a lot of them mostly stem out of the Ricci flow, right? So we talked about the Kähler Ricci flow. Oh yeah, there's also the Calabi flow. These are Kähler Ricci flow and Calabi flow are maybe the two classic ones in Kähler geometry. But uh, since then, uh, there's been a lot of other flows that are adapted to um, other um, uh, more specialized or other settings, not more specialized, other settings in, in, in non kähler geometry. There's a lot of different ways to uh, generalize the Kähler condition. And depending on how you generalize it, you may write down a flow that's better suited for that particular setup. And so here's a list here, of course, including many of the participants in the uh, uh, tacos, in this taco session, right? I've contributed here. And um, so today uh, uh, I'm going to talk about the, or I'll, 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 I'll end with the, the um, uh, try to motivate the last one of these flows, which is a, a flow um, which is in a non killer geometry setup, um, but where the equations come from string theory. So before um, we get to this flow, I'd like to describe a little bit the uh, complex geometry setup and where uh, these equations come from. 
So, um, so this next part of the talk is just going to describe a little bit how uh, equations from complex geometry can come out of string theory. So the question we'd like to describe or to discuss a little bit is, is, is why would a string theorist um, write down the equation of a complex manifold? Or why would a physicist want complex geometry? Um, that's, that's, that's the question I'd like to discuss. So, you know, why would a, a physicist be interested in differential geometry, right? So that starts here, um, 1915, uh, where Einstein proposed the theory of general relativity um, using the language that had been developed in the 1870s by Riemann and before that Gauss. But uh, yeah, using, you know, the, the language and, um, <clears throat> and, and, and ideas and objects from Riemannian geometry, uh, here comes Einstein proposing uh, to use this to model um, movement of planets and, and objects with very large mass. So um, at a simplistic level, right, with general relativity, it's a theory, and it's really involving the metric tensor. The metric tensor is the gravitational potential. And, um, and again, the, the idea is uh, in Newtonian gravity, right, the potential satisfies a Laplace equation or a Poisson equation in the, or sorry, Poisson equation or Laplace equation in a vacuum. And so Einstein's generalization goes from a potential function, single function, to now the metric gij is supposed to be potential. So the right equation should be a Laplacian of the metric tensor. And uh, just like we discussed with the Ricci flow, you want to think of Laplacian of the metric. The way to do that uh, is by um, taking the Ricci of it. And so that's Einstein's equations. Einstein's field equation is that the uh, right generalization of uh, the um, Laplace equation in Newtonian gravity should be the Ricci uh, of the metric tensor is equal to zero. And uh, in physics, there's there's the principle of least action, right? Which is that the you know the 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 laws of nature should be obtained by uh, extremizing or finding critical points of an action functional. So if you um, and uh, and, and so this equation Ricci zero does arise as the critical points of an action. Uh, so that's the Einstein-Hilbert functional, the integral of the scalar curvature. You, um, yeah, if you take critical points of this, uh, you can get the Ricci zero. And uh, and so right. So anyway, so for for general relativity, um, that's the main object of the game. It's 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 Riemannian geometry, not quite right because there's a signature thing. It's in Lorentzian signature, but uh, it's a theory about a manifold and a metric tensor. That's general relativity. Next, let's talk about things that are, so that's things that are very big. Let's talk about things that are very small. It's particle physics. This is Yang Mills, uh, Yang Mills theory. So here's a paper um, by Yang and Mills, 1954. They want to describe particle physics and what's the main object that they propose to study this. It's a um, vector bundle over a manifold and it's the curvature of a connection. So they have this equation four here um, that we recognize as the curvature of a connection on a vector bundle. And um, right, and the key is that this uh, combination <clears throat> uh, of, uh, of, 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 of the connection transforms in this way five, right? So other simple functions of the gauge potential do not lead to such a simple uh, transformation property. So that's the main object you're looking for. So in, in this Yang Mills theory, you've got a vector bundle and you're looking at a space of connections on this vector bundle for a special connection. And the special connection is the one solving the Yang Mills equation. And again, there's a principle of least action. The Yang Mills connection um, should arise uh, as the critical points of an action functional. And the action functional here is a natural one L2 norm of the curvature. So you have a space of connection and you look for connections which are critical points of the L2 norm of the curvature. They should be optimal connections in this thing. And Yang and Mills uh, proposed to use that to model um, particle physics. Um, so, right, at a very high level, right, uh, we've got two theories. One is general relativity involves a metric tensor. One is Yang Mills theory involves connections over a vector bundle. And so we're looking for a unified theory that's going to bring both together. Um, and there's many subtleties that 
what I don't understand and I'm also <laughs> disregarding, but at a, at a very high level, right? Whatever a unified theory should be, it's got to have aspects of both. It's got to be some equations where you've got on one hand, a metric, uh, and on the other hand, a connection on a vector bundle. And this has to be coupled and um, both ingredients have to be there together in the, in the theory. And there should be uh, an action, an action functional. It's going to involve um, both these things, uh, and taking critical points of that action should give uh, the equations of of nature. That's at the very high level. Um, some of the goals here, and uh, one of the crazy ideas of string theory is to uh, cross in a compact manifold to our. So we've got our regular three dimensions of space one dimension of time. Uh, and then the proposal is then cross a compact manifold, right, which is very small. Uh, and then write down all your equations on this product structure. And then do some kind of dimensional reduction or maybe put an ansatz or kind of try to reduce your equations from this product structure to the equations on this compact manifold, on the string compactification and see what kind of geometry does this compact manifold have to have. It's going to have to be special. It can't be, you can't just cross in a random thing there and then expect to get some of the laws of nature to fall out. I mean, if, if you know, there should be some structure right, in, um, in the equations that we're looking at that descend to M and give M very special uh, structure that it should have to be kind of admissible in this kind of program. So that's what we're going to talk about. But before there's one more thing, one more ingredient uh, I'd like to uh, focus or not focus on, but uh, briefly present, uh, and that's supersymmetry. Uh, right. So because we haven't talked about particles of spin and adding matter. So this, so another uh, component of this model is uh, you need spinners. So you need particles with spin. And this is modeled by uh, sections of a spin bundle over your manifold. And so this is an action here, going back to the Yang-Mills theory, right? So before we just had the integral of the norm of F squared. Okay, now we add a matter term, right? We add a, a spinner valued object. And, um, and that modifies the functional. And well, one of the principles of, of supersymmetry is that for every field or every like section or every object that you're looking for that doesn't have a spin component, there should be a partner. There should be a second one, which is a spin partner, which does have a spin component to it. And um, so in this case, it's this chi here, which is an endomorphism of the vector bundle. And it has this tensored with a um, bundle of a spin, spin component. And the supersymmetric action is one that has a symmetry where you can switch uh, the one that doesn't have a spin with the one that has a spin. So it, it exchanges a spinner field with a non-spinner field. So the way this works is you have this energy here, S. Oh, yeah, never mind about the, there's a minus trace. It's because if you're in the adjoint bundle, right, there's the, if you have a, <clears throat> like skew symmetric matrices, the inner product is minus trace AB. That's the inner product on the, so, so this second term is actually positive. Uh, so this is a truly a energy functional and, and it has this supersymmetry, which is uh, take the, so take the derivative of this S. So pretend the A and the chi, they move in like say a one parameter family and then take D by DT of S. So you're gonna differentiate this functional but then the crazy thing that physicists do, right? The totally crazy thing is when you take the derivative, right? You'll have your a dot and your chi dot. Instead of leaving it as a dot chi dot, you switch it, right? So with these supersymmetry rules, so the, the delta a, so the variation of a is not another object like a, it's an object like chi. Um, so it gets switched with the spinner valued one. But of course, then the indices have to match up on both sides. So you introduce these gamma matrices to make that work. Uh, and similarly with the variation of chi, um, it has the F, which is the curvature of A, that's an object like A, uh, but then that has two indices, there's no indices on the left, so you've got to trace out those indices. There's also this epsilon, right? <laughs> so epsilon is supposed to represent the direction of differentiation. So it's like taking a directional derivative and the epsilon is kind of representing what direction you are differentiating. Um, so anyway, so that's one of that's at a very high level one of the ideas of supersymmetry. You want to functionally differentiate it. You switch the spinner fields with the non-spinner field, and you get a symmetry there. So the action is going to be a lot more complicated uh, in string theory. So this is one of the proposed actions. 
I surely transcribed it incorrectly. The coefficients here are all wrong. Also, I put dot, 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 so I'm not even <laughs> including everything. Okay, but this is just, just to give, you know, at a high level, right, this is one of the actions that's that's proposed. The first term, you've got the R, right? you got the Einstein-Hilbert, uh, you got the norm of F squared, right? You got the kind of yang Mills, but then you also have a bunch of other stuff. There's more fields now. There's not just the GIJ and the bundle connection. There's a three form field strength that's introduced here. There's a scalar function that's introduced here. And then they all have their super partners. So there's all the spinner valued ones that come with them as well. The action mixes all that together. And this action is uh, super symmetric. So it's written in a way that there is this super symmetry. You take your uh, super symmetric variation and there's a way to switch the non-spinner fields with the spinner fields and get this kind of high level symmetry. And so here's the paper where uh, string theory led to um, complex geometry. So this is Kandelas, Horowitz, Strominger, Witten, 1985. Here are the equations from supersymmetry for this more complicated functional as 2.1. Uh, you know, now we've got a lot more different fields. And um, what they're looking for is, right, so they're looking for the condition for invariance of the vacuum under a supersymmetric transformation generated by some parameter epsilon is that for every field alpha, delta alpha is equal to zero. So they're looking for um, <clears throat> what's called like unbroken uh, supersymmetry, which is that they want all these parameters, all these fields, G, H, uh, et cetera, to be invariant under this, uh, this um, flow by the supersymmetry, if you think of it that way. So in other words, uh, all these supersymmetry derivatives, uh, they're looking for solutions where all of those are zero. And this gives a whole bunch of equations on, well, the fields, the G, the H, and also the spinner epsilon. So if you set all those equations 2.1 to zero, uh, what they do in this paper, uh, Kendallus, Horner, Strominger, Witten, um, is they look for special solutions of this equation, setting all the supersymmetric uh, transformations to zero. They look for special solutions, and what do they find? They find kahler ritchie flat metrics. And as far as I can tell, I think this is the first time in the literature where the word, the, the name Calabiao, methyl to Calabiao space, uh, was introduced. I, I, I think this is what started the name uh, Calabialis. For I can't find earlier references in any case. So here, right here, we are. String theorists. They started from equations on spinners, um, you know, involving ideas from Yang Mills, general relativity, uh, supersymmetry, and a lot more. Basically, not complex geometry. They're not looking. Right? They weren't looking for complex manifolds, but they looked uh, um, at these equations seven to zero, and they found kahler ritchie flat metrics. Um, they found Calabial. <clears throat> the Calabiao equation. And uh, well, I don't know. Yeah, this was a bright, big, exciting moment, right? Where, uh, um, you know, uh, objects that pure mathematicians had been studying and been interested in, um, right? Yao's proof of the Calabi conjecture, uh, Kahler Ritchie flat metrics are, uh, uh, were, were constructed maybe 10 years, 10 years earlier by, by Yao. So there's lots of examples. Algebraic geometers, of course, also interested in uh, Calabial manifolds. Uh, they're one of the building blocks in the minimal model program. So a lot of people for completely different reasons were arriving and interest, interested in, in, in these objects. Um, but they were looking for special solutions, right? Candelas, Horowitz, Strominger, Witten. Um, they made some simplifying assumptions. Among them, they set the three form field strength. There was this H there, they set that to zero. There's a phi there, they set that to be a constant and then looked for solutions. And what they found were Kahler Calabio metrics. This is a passage from um, their paper here. And they say, uh, although there exists the intriguing possibility of a solution with non-zero H, it appears quite difficult to satisfy all these equations unless H vanishes. So what are those equations? So here's what they look like uh, if you set those supersymmetric variations to zero. So if Candelas, Horowitz, Strominger, Witten um, set h and phi to be constant. So that second equation is uh, automatically satisfied. And the first one is just that the spinner epsilon should be covariantly constant. Um, and uh, covariantly constant spinner, this <coughs> was what led into these SU SU3 structures. But in general, if you have a non-zero h and a non-constant phi, the question is, do you still get complex geometry in general without this uh, additional assumption of h0 and phi constant? And the answer is you do yes. So for example, there's this paper of Strominger that uh, 
works out what happens when you leave the h and the phi, not necessarily zero. And so the result is this. Uh, so if you dimension six positive chirality spinner, it should be non-vanishing. You normalize it so as norm one. You solve these two equations from supersymmetry. These conditions on spinners um, equip the manifold M with a holomorphic structure. Um, so you go from smooth differential geometry to holomorphic differential geometry. Um, you can write down an almost complex structure using the spinner and you can compute its nine house tensor and you're gonna get zero. And so Newlander Nuremberg is gonna say you're a holomorphic. And more than that, um, not only did uh, we enter complex geometry, but we entered uh, what you could call Calabial geometry, but it's not Kähler. So um, uh, what comes out of these equations is not a Kähler metric. Uh, D of omega is not zero, but D of the square of omega, there's also a conformal factor here is zero. So it's, um, conformally balanced metric. Um, and it also has trivial canonical bundle. It does have a holomorphic bulling form. So this is the geometry that we'd like to study coming from these equations from physics. We have complex manifold, uh, hol holomorphic volume form, conformally balanced metric. And we want to understand this non kähler geometry, the space of, of metrics um, with this structure. And so together with uh, D.H. Fong and uh, Xuan Zhang, we uh, propose to use this flow here to study this space of metrics. So if you start with one, go along this flow and see where the flow takes you. The um, key property of this flow is that it preserves the balance condition. So if you start balanced, you stay balanced. And that's just because the right-hand side of this flow here is already D of something. So if you take the evolution of uh, D of uh, omega squared, you're going to get like three Ds or well, two, whatever. You're going to get a lot of Ds. So that's going to be zero. So if it starts closed, it stays closed. So this flow is going to show us a path in the space of metrics. Um, well, of course, it's um, you can write down any flow you want, right? But it has to have a short time existence, right? So this flow does have short time existence. We prove there's a unique solution, small time interval. Um, if this flow did converge, uh, this is a stationary point. So the flow moves in the space of conformally balanced metrics. <clears throat> so that's the first equation. And the second equation is just setting the right-hand side of the flow to zero. So if the flow did converge, you would have a metric which simult simultaneously solves those two equations. And it's well known that uh, solving those two equations imply that you are Kähler and Ricci flat. So our flow is a deformation from non kähler Calabial to kähler Calabial geometry. So we hope that it could be used to study questions of like um, detecting whether or not a non kähler manifold is in fact Kähler. So uh, kind of one dream project or one dream application would be there's this uh, conjecture that you have a, a complex manifold that has two metrics. One of them's balanced and the other one's pluriclosed then in fact, it should have a third metric, which is Kähler. This is still an open problem. There's a lot of special examples. This conjecture does hold true, but in general, we don't know. And kind of a dream could be to use this flow. You'd start with the balanced one, go with the flow, use the pluri-closed one, um, give you as a barrier, maybe get some integral estimates, maybe use some barriers using the maximum principle, and then maybe you hope to show the flow converges. I tried, couldn't do it, so I'm not working on this anymore. I don't know, it's pretty hard, but you know, that's that's kind of one of the potential dream applications of uh, of this flow. Um, right, it's supposed to be a generalization of the Ricci flow. How does this look like the Ricci flow? Well, actually, if you evolve the metric, so well, Fei Fong pointed out there's a better combination to evolve. If you evolve the metric times this conformal factor, see how that moves, right? The flow gives you how does the square of it move, but then you can go extract how does the metric itself move? And it does evolve by some version of the Ricci flow. It's got the, the Ricci first, but then it also has a first order term. The crazy thing about this is that this, um, so this fits into a general family of what's called the Hermitian curvature flows introduced by Street Sian. And the, one of the crazy things about this is the um, term that arises on the right-hand side here with the one half and the plus is exactly the, um, term that was identified by Ustinovsky. Um, so uh, Street-Sian Hermitian curvature flow, very general, you can put any 
uh, quadratic T term on the right hand side there. And Yustinovsky looked in, in that family for special combinations of T that would preserve certain positivity conditions. And he identified with T has three indices. So there's different ways of contracting them. And he found this particular way with a plus one half was kind of an optimal one because it preserved Griffith's positivity. And here we are coming from completely different point of view, equations from string theory, uh, you know, evolve it using this, then look at this conformally change. And uh, I still don't understand why we got the exact same uh, with the plus one half and everything as Justinovsky. Um, but uh, in any case, it kind of shows that this flow kind of singles out an interesting um, specific uh, um, flow out of this family of uh, Hermitian curvature flows. Um, so that's with uh, the, 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 the um, the simplest kind of instance of this flow, there are also generalizations, right? It doesn't have to be dimension three. We can generalize this to higher dimensions. Uh, we can put a source term on the right-hand side, right? So without this psi, right, we discussed that it's, it's moving in the space of non-Kaler towards Kaler, right? But now if you want to look maybe for special non-Kaler metrics, you can put a psi here. And this psi um, should be motivated uh, from string theory. Some candidates, there's a, equations from type 2b string theory that suggests that uh, this psi should be Poincaré dual polymorphic curves. There's also equations from this heterotic string theory that suggests that the source phi should be these alpha prime corrections in the anomaly cancellation equations. So there's, you know, depending on your context, you may choose different phi's and you may be looking for different things. Um, and so this is kind of the broader setup for our flow. We have special examples, but uh, the one uh, general theorem we have is, is this one here for long time existence. So this theorem says that along this flow, uh, as long as your evolving metrics stay uniformly bounded and also the gradient of the log of this norm stays bounded, uh, then you can continue the flow. So if you're looking at singularities or blow up of the flow, what's gonna happen is one of these bounds has got a break and well, in fact, in all the examples we have, the only one that breaks is the upper bound for little omega. So I'm starting to suspect the other ones could be removed, especially this gradient of log, but uh, unable to do it. It could also be that our examples aren't sophisticated enough, uh, or maybe I think maybe our, 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 our PDE techniques um, still need to be improved. So I don't know. So that's a question whether, um, we really need all these, but at the very least, uh, there's a singularity that means one of these bounds is going to break. And um, and that's our general theorem. And then in, in other specific examples, we have more specific things to say, but that's all I wanted to say today. So thank you very much for your attention. All right. Thank you, Sebastian.